Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very fortunate to be hosting Levi Klisch. Levi is the Clean Annapolis River Projects, CARP's Executive Director, has been taking the position in July of 2014. He's been involved with CARP since 1998 and has worked on a wide variety of projects including aquatic and riparian habitat restoration, agricultural stewardship projects, pollution prevention, and various ecological sampling and monitoring programs. After the presentation, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. You'll have the option of asking questions directly to Levi using your microphone, or you can type them in and Michelle will read them aloud. I'm now going to turn the webinar over to Levi. Hello. Um, as Darla said, my name is Levi Klisch. I'm with Clean Annapolis River Project, um, and the subject I was asked to present on today was uh, Broken Brooks, which has been a program of Clean Annapolis River Projects for a number of years now. Um, and uh, over the years, there's been many different partners involved, um, mainly NSLC Adopt a Stream. Um, anyway, what I plan to go through today um, is one, who we are as Clean, Clean Annapolis River Project, um, what we look at with aquatic connectivity, what its importance is, um, different ways in which culverts can act as barriers to fish passage. Um, I'll go over the Broken Brooks program uh, from its beginning, its development, and basically where it's going now. Um, look at briefly uh, the data collection process, um, mostly by reviewing um, data sheets and look at the type of data that we collect, um, the analysis that we apply to the data. Look at ways in which we prioritize um, culverts for restorations and uh, summarize some of the results of the program to date. And hopefully, at the end of that, leave a little bit of time for discussion and questions. To start off, um, the Clean Apples River Project is an NGO established in 1990. We're actually about to celebrate 25 years on the 19th of this month. Um, we're based in Annapolis, Royal Nova Scotia, and our mission is to enhance the ecological health of the Annapolis River watershed through science, leadership, and community engagement. So to that end, uh, we take on a large variety of projects, um, some of which are environmental um, and ecological monitoring projects. We do a lot of uh, community outreach and engagement at the moment, um, stakeholder engagement, environmental restoration, and various other uh, pollution mitigation projects, etc. Here you can see a map of the Annapolis River watershed. Um, its borders uh, very well defined in that map. Um, the, the pale area in the center um, delineates the area. So if you can read the town names, you'll see that uh, the headwaters um, up here or begin around Aylesford or east of Aylesford um, in a bog area and run downstream from and uh, are contributed to by the north and the south mountains on either side, run down through into the Annapolis Basin and then exit into the Bay of Fundy. Um, the watershed's quite large. Um, it's 2,000 kilometers squared in size, uh, about 100 kilometers in length between East Aylesford and Digby. It's the third largest watershed in Nova Scotia. And as I mentioned before, it's bordered by the North and the South Mountains, um, both of which have numerous tributaries that, uh, that run down the face of the mountain, across the valley, um, and into the Annapolis River. The Annapolis River is actually uh, one of the sites of the older European settlements in Nova Scotia, uh, in North America. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite well developed. There's number of residential areas. It's uh, it's covered in farmland. There's a great deal of forestry in the in the headwater areas. So what that translates to is quite a few roadways throughout the watershed. And um, due to the fact that we have many roadways and many tributaries, there's a lot of intersection between the two, which leads to a large number of crossings. Um, really, the focus of the Broken Brooks project is aquatic connectivity. Um, so aquatic connectivity really is the, um, the connectivity of fish habitats in a, in a watershed or the access that fish have to various habitats within a, within a watershed for various life stages. Um, this diagram illustrates quite well that um, the placement of a barrier within a watershed has quite a bit of impact on the degree of fragmentation that, uh, that can be caused by that barrier. We know that aquatic connectivity is quite important. Fish passage in aquatic ecosystem is, um, is essential for the survival of many species. Atlantic salmon are a prime example. 
where access to headwater areas to spawn um, is absolutely critical to the reproduction of the species. So, I mean, a barrier culvert um, or any other type of barrier low down in a, in a sub-watershed um, pretty much um, prevents any, any reproduction of the species. Uh, we know that barrier culverts are leading to habitat fragment, uh, fragmentation. Uh, we observed that quite a while ago in the Annapolis River watershed, but there are many studies that show that um, in, in other areas. Um, Habitat fragmentation reduces access to favorable habitats for spawning, feeding, overwintering, and thermal refuge. Um, I think, for example, for thermal refuge um, in the summertime, the lower areas in the watershed um, are often um, often quite warm, and fish need to escape to uh, to headwater areas in order to to reach cooler water and avoid stress and potentially death. And uh, barrier crossings can also isolate fish populations, so um, create uh, pocket habitats essentially that uh, are susceptible to, to disturbance, uh, for example, siltation. So um, if fish are unable to migrate out of the habitats in which they exist um, to avoid events like that, then they will um, they'll be stressed or die. Well, a few examples here of how uh, culverts can pose barriers to fish passage. Outflow drops, as seen here, are pretty much the poster child, um, very easily recognizable. Um, easy to see why a, an outflow drop could be a barrier to fish passage. Um, the one on the left being a fairly extreme example. The one on the right a little more subtle. Um, what we know is that uh, different fish species have differing abilities to, to jump. Um, and, you know, so varying degrees of outflow drop will uh, will cause less or more of a problem depending on species and also size of the fish. Um, I mean, Atlantic salmon are known for their jumping capability, um, but species like uh, rainbow smelt uh, don't tend to jump at all, so a very little outflow drop is able to prevent them from migrating up or downstream. Excessive water velocity is another issue that you run into fairly frequently. Um, culverts that are placed at an inappropriate slope aren't embedded in the channel or have a very smooth interior surface um, often contribute to high velocities. And this is a problem because uh, fish aren't able to sustain really high speeds um, that allow them to swim from the well through the culverts uh, and then make it across the other side. And if there's no uh, turbulence within the culvert, burst speeds that they're able to to maintain for short periods of time aren't enough to get them through either. Incorrect sizing causes problems, whether a culvert's too small or too large. Um, a culvert that's too small is unable to handle the flows of a water of a water course, um, causing overtopping of the culvert, flooding, erosion, etc. Um, the culvert that's too large um, basically displaces water over a large area, um, so you create basically an overwide, wide and uh, shallow reach in the river that fish aren't able to navigate. Again, inadequate depth, um, this is just a couple other examples, um, can be caused by reasons other than a, a culvert that's over wide, such as deterioration. Um, here are two examples. Um, deteriorating metal, metal culverts often will develop holes and the water will run down through and create a dry channel in the culvert itself um, while the water percolates underneath and around, basically making the culvert uh, non-navigable. Deteriorating culverts also um, often cause physical barriers as they collapse and, uh, and uh, basically create uh, physical blockages within the channel. Debris is a common concern. It can come from many sources. Um, oftentimes we've noticed that culverts in, uh, in wetland areas accumulate a lot of debris um, just because of the organic matter upstream. Um, large pieces of debris can wash from downstream or from upstream and uh, get jammed against the the inflow of a culvert and then start accumulating smaller de debris and gradually sediments. Also, culverts make very attractive sites for uh, for beavers to build dams. Uh, they're a nice narrow area. Uh, the dams are already partially built for them, so um, you know it's a good opportunity to to reduce their amount of work and uh, and create a barrier. So over time, I mean, these accumulate sediment and smaller debris and then become extremely clogged, um, basically preventing any fish from getting through. With all the issues that are known um, about culverts and, and the fact that we understood that we had um, a lot of potential for issues in the Annapolis River watershed, uh, 
CARP decided to uh, to do a little something about it. So uh, we created the Broken Brooks project. Um, so the project consists of, well, the assessment portion of the project consists of five parts. Um, one very important step, especially in a large watershed, is to be able to identify all the culverts in the watershed so that you can look at the watershed holistically. Um, prioritize the culverts to survey first, um, so decide which ones are actually um, a high priority and would actually contribute to, uh, to better and more, um, more open fish habitat. Actually going out and uh, taking measurements on the culvert, evaluating the bar barrier based on the data that you collect, and uh, prioritizing barriers for remediation um, prior to conducting remediation planning. Over the years, a number of protocols were brought into the uh, into the project. Um, I'll go over that just a little bit later um, on some other slides. But um, there are four there are four documents that were used. Uh, one by the uh, British Columbia Ministry of Environment was the original one uh, on the first Broken Brooks project. Um, some work that was done in Terranova National Park um, with Memorial University as well in 2009. Um, work that was done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Forest Service and, um, and a document by Fisheries and Oceans Canada and guidelines that they created. The first project that, uh, that CARP undertook called Broken Brooks happened in 2007. Um, so that was a result of um, a student project in 2006 that, uh, that looked at road water course crossings in the Annapolis watershed. So it was a GIS project that looked at um, at watercourse layers and looked at roadway layers and took each intersection of a, of a watercourse and a roadway and created a point. So each of those points um, were considered a potential barrier. Um, so instead at that time, um, the only protocol that we had um, that were fully developed uh, were the ones from DC Ministry of the Environment. Uh, so those are the ones that guided the work that we did that, that year. And uh, prioritization was done based on some uh, some older studies that CARP had in office that looked at uh, that looked at water quality over a number of tributaries to the Annapolis River watershed. Looked for uh, for some of the tributaries that had a good buffering capacity, uh, basically contributing to decent pH, um, and also had good temperature regimes. So ones that had decent water quality for salmonids. Um, and also systems that were known to have decent productivity from, from past electrofishing surveys and also from uh, anecdotal evidence from angles. Here's a map of um, the Annapolis River watershed. So this is the one that was generated by Andrea Combs, um, who was in St. Mary's University. Um, so these are all the road water course intersections in the Annapolis River watershed that were identified through that. Um, as it says there, there were 1,615 potential barriers that were that were identified. So um, really, we had and still have a big job ahead of us uh, to actually go out and assess and, and prioritize all of these culverts. And also, keep in mind that these are intersections between fairly major watercourses and major roadways. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of farmland and a lot of forest land um, in, within the watershed, and some of these roads are on private property, um, aren't necessarily going to be mapped roads, and some of the watercourses aren't mapped either. So um, there could be numerous more. Um, culverts than the ones that are represented here. The next phase of the program began in 2010. Um, so what happened is that um, Kitty and Kujik National Park were looking at applying protocol that, were, that uh, was developed in Terra Nova and what they wanted to do was um, assess aquatic connectivity within the park using what was called the Dendritic Connectivity Index or DCI and what that did was uh, basically assess all the culverts within the watershed um, and use modeling software called fish crossing um, to model whether or not the, the berries were passable to fish. And they used, I think, a 10 centimeter brook trout as the, uh, as the target. Um, basically then statistical analysis was performed using our software and then the visual representation was uh, was generated using ArcGIS. Um, it was a fairly complicated process and it gave a decent uh, product. Um, it was very useful for a fairly small water watershed um, and what it gave them was prioritization of all the culverts within the watershed and allowed them to, to identify which culverts they should be addressing to achieve maximum um, improvements in connectivity within the park. Um, at the same time, partnership developed between KEGI, um, 
the adopt stream program, Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute, NCARP. Um, there are other groups that, uh, that got involved later on. And what happened at that time is that, uh, that adopt a stream funded MTRI and uh, MTRI produced protocols um, with the idea that they could be used by community groups across Nova Scotia to, to start assessing culverts within their own watersheds and, uh, and can contribute that to a larger provincial um, base of knowledge. So the protocols that, uh, that were developed by MTRI used a combination of all the protocols that I would mentioned earlier. So those ones by uh, BC Ministry of Environment, Terra Nova National Park as mentioned, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And because at this time we're looking at the dendritic connectivity index and the idea was that uh, the data from all the groups around the province would be analyzed by MTRI to give that as an output, um, culverts were prioritized based on position in the watershed. So the uh, lower the, um, a culvert was in the watershed or the closer it was to the main body of water, the final destination in essence, um, the higher priority it would be given for restoration, the higher pri priority it was given to be assessed in the first place. Um, MTRI provided um, training to various community groups, including CARP, um, and also training protocols and, and technical support. And when all the assessments were done, essentially took the data in and uh, attempted to analyze it to produce uh, DCI outputs. At that time, too, CARP um, and, um, did quite a number of culvert assessments that year, um, and also integrated culvert restoration into the Broken Brooks project where um, in the first iteration all we had done were, uh, were um, the analyses. In 2011, uh, CARP wound up partnering, partnering with adopt a stream to revise the training program um, and then some of the protocols. So we stopped trying to use the DCI at that time. Uh, it was just a little bit too complicated to, to actually apply, especially to some of the water, water, larger watersheds like the Annapolis River watershed. Um, so that year, uh, training was given to several, uh, several community groups across the province. Um, CAR provided technical support throughout the field season to the community groups that were collecting data. Um, and also, we created a reporting template. So uh, try to, con um, to create a consistent reporting template uh, that all community groups would, uh, would use, essentially that uh, CARP would, uh, would produce for them so that all the, uh, all the culvert assessment data would be pre presented in a consistent way. At the same time, um, alternate methods of prioritizing culverts for, for restoration were developed that used a few basic uh, considerations. I'll go over those a little later as well. In 2012 and 2013, um, some of the assessment protocols underwent some further refinements. So we're getting a little more experience um, with the program and again discussions with Adopt a Stream and some other uh, some other organizations that were involved involved in a uh, in an advisory committee. We decided to to tweak it a little bit. Um, CARP then also returned to a sub-watershed uh, based prioritization approach. Um, we were finding because of the size of the watershed. Um, it just assessing the ones that were lower in the watershed had us uh, driving up and down 100 kilometer long watershed not being really efficient. We were assessing a lot of culverts on mediocre fish habitat so we decided at that time to start focusing in on uh, sub watersheds that we knew provided significant fish habitat and, and also at the time we were um, combining culvert assessment to, or aquatic connectivity assessment with larger sub watershed assessment protocols where we're actually looking at uh, various other management issues within, within sub-watersheds of the Annapolis River. CARP continued to deliver training, data analysis, and report writing um, until 2013 for community groups in partnership with Adopt Stream as well. Um, this past field season and going into this one, a few more changes were made. Um, one of the things that CARP did, where we'd been spending several years assessing culverts and restoring some of them, um, and changing protocols, we found that we had a bunch of varying data sets uh, that weren't really integrated and couldn't really be looked at holistically. So in the spring of 2014, um, these were smoothed out. One, uh, one large spreadsheet was created and the data was presented in a consistent fashion. So what we hope to be able to do with that is to, uh, to like I say, um, look at all the 
culverts and analyze them holistically and try to prioritize culverts for restoration by looking at the entire data set rather than um, the data set from any given year, one year at a time. And then you know, what happens is you lose track and, and leave some behind and, and, and don't look at the big picture. Uh, the Broken Brooks program, um, as of the end of this last field season, is going to be shifting primarily to restoration in, for the next year or two. Um, basically, we've got a large number of, uh, of assessments, and uh, we're going to be able to do some analysis on those. We'd really like to fix a lot of the problems before we move on and do more, more um, assessments. The data collection sheets for community groups were refined even further this year. Um, that was in partnership with Adopt a Stream. And so Adopt-a-Stream now has a consistent format um, that's used by all community groups. And uh, there's some um, more capacity that's been added to capture data on battles. Um, it also, because we've been working on a, a database um, or the creation of a database over time, um, the data sheet was created to allow a little bit more compatibility with that. Um, as uh, my upstream also at the same time hired a coordinator to do the group training, um, the technical support over the field season, data analysis and reporting, so they've improved their capacity to provide that in-house. And uh, as we speak, we're in the middle of developing the online database to house culvert data, um, culvert assessment data provincially, so uh, we're still working that out, but uh, we have a, a good field data sheet and, and a pretty good base trace. A database. This, um, what I'm going to go over um, through the next pages, are fragments or pieces of um, CARP's field assessment data sheet. I'm not going to get into the very specific techniques of how the assessments are, are undertaken. That's a whole other presentation in and of itself. Um, this, if anyone's familiar with the adopt -a stream template, is different in appearance and a little bit different in order, um, but identical in content. Um, Essentially, uh, we had a supplementary sheet for some of the baffle data, so that won't be present there for anyone, like I say, who's familiar. But uh, just to go through it really quickly, um, take some general information about the culvert, the site, uh, um, uh, coordinates, and uh, water quality data, etc. Get into some, to some information about the culvert construction, so it's important to know, um, especially if you intend to in the future use uh, modeling, some of the modeling software to uh, to assess the the uh, possibility of the culvert. You need to look at the culvert shape, the material, um, and general construction. Whether or not it's embedded in the channel, whether there's beaver activity, it's important also to note whether or not you uh, notice fish present at the site. Also, um, channel measurements are taken uh, to get an idea of how the, the culvert is sized in relation to the natural channel. And um, several physical measurements of the culvert are taken. Um, so culvert diameter, height, etc. Um, and also um, several measurements are taken with a survey, survey rod and survey level to get an idea of various elevations throughout the reach and elevations um, on the culvert to get an idea of what the slope of the culvert is, what the slope of the channel is, etc. Again, um, there's other habitat uh, characteristics that are taken. This, uh, this gives you an idea a bit about the, the habitat in which the culvert is placed. Um, we've also found it's quite useful in planning restorations from the office rather than having to go back to each culvert and collect all of this data afterward to, to complete a restoration design. So this is more information again about the downstream channel. This diagram, uh, this is from the, the assessment protocol manual. Um, it shows various points uh, at which you place a survey rod to, to um, undertake a, a culvert survey. So it's a good reference, uh, a good reference document that should be carried in field uh, when a person is doing culvert, uh, culvert assessments. This give you an idea where the measurements are taken. Once we have the culvert data collected, um, we have to come up with an assessment criteria. So over time, this changed. I mean, it went from uh, very, very complex um, using the DCI protocols, um, and uh, then I guess further protocols were developed in 2010, and these were altered um, over the years. And this is what we have now. Um, 
basically, if we're going to consider a culvert a non-barrier, um, it's going to have to meet the provincial guidelines in Nova Scotia, which are which are based on the DFO guidelines that were created. So, um, a non-barrier culvert um, is considered a culvert that has absolutely no outflow drop and a slope um, that's under five percent. Anything outside of those criteria falls into a barrier culvert, which is then assessed as to whether or not it's a partial barrier or a full barrier. So a partial barrier has an outflow drop that's less than two body lengths of the target species or the target size for the species that you're looking at. Um, in the case of broken brooks, we look at brook trout that are five centimeters in size. Um, we're really trying to uh, to take a fairly critical assessment, so um, we use a very small target uh, target size. Also, the culvert slope has to fall between 0.5 and 2.5 percent. Uh, anything greater than that becomes a, a full barrier. So an outflow drop between two body lengths of the target species or culvert slope over two and a half percent. This is just a flow chart that shows the same information. It's another way to visualize it. Um, so the next thing that we do uh, once we've decided whether it's a partial barrier or full barrier, um, and we have to do something about it, we have to assess what the options are for remediation. Uh, we haven't historically had a lot of options. Um, that uh, that were possible for us to implement. Uh, Adopt Stream right now is looking at a number of different ways that uh, that restorations can uh, can take place. But uh, our toolbox is basically what you see in front of us here. Um, so for partial barriers, had several criteria based on slope, whether or not there was debris present, um, and whether or not there were outflow drops, the size of the outflow drop, and the types of remediations that uh, that could take place. Primarily what we've done throughout the course of the Broken Brooks program has been uh, debris removals and the installation of uh, tailwater controls, um, basically weirs downstream of, um, of a culvert that raised the water level to accommodate to, uh, for an outflow drop. And these criteria were taken from the BC uh, Ministry of Environment document that was mentioned earlier. In order to prioritize culverts for restoration, um, a couple of criteria were looked at again. So um, we looked at uh, the number of downstream barriers. So basically, um, you know, how many barriers are downstream between uh, the Annapolis Basin or the Bay of Fundy and the culvert itself. So anything with zero barriers got a high score, one barrier, um, a bit lesser of a score, and greater than two barriers scored zero. Um, in terms of upstream habitat gain, obviously the more upstream habitat that we're able to, to make accessible, the greater the point value that was assigned to that particular culvert um, in order to prioritize it. Whoops. You can see that uh, the different scoring ranges were, were um, also assigned categories of high, medium, and low. Here's a table summarizing some of the results by year of the work that CARP's done, um, starting in 2007, uh, with the number of culverts that, uh, that were assessed, number of barriers that were, that were determined, and what percent of the culverts were determined to be barriers. You'll notice that uh, while starting 2010, I guess, we really picked up some steam um, and assessed a lot of culverts. And it's been going down, I guess, gradually since. Part of the reason I should explain for that um, is that the assessment protocols um, in 2007 to 2011 allowed for what was called a, was a preliminary assessment or a rapid, uh, rapid assessment, which was visual and looked at a few different criteria, like whether or not there was an outflow drop present, um, I think it uh, estimated slope and a couple of other things. Um, we thought that that uh, really accounted more for, for the environment at the time, so it really didn't accurately represent what might have been going on at various other times and really give you a hard number for slope um, and some of the other measurements. So in 2012 we started doing full assessments, so the detailed assessments that we went over just a little earlier um, on every single culvert that we did and thus I mean it took a lot more time to, to do a culvert assessment. Also 2013-2014 again like I mentioned before um, we started to, incorporating culvert assessments into a larger um, sub-watershed 
planning protocol. So there are other things happening on the side um, that took some focus away from the culvert rest or the culvert uh, assessments themselves. You'll also notice that uh, as we get a little more critical with our culvert assessments, our surveys in field, um, it looks like the percent of culverts uh, that were deemed to be barriers jumped. Uh, and so I think you know our instinct may have been correct that uh, the rapid assessments weren't really accounting for some of the barriers that were that were there. Again, to summarize the results, um, we've assessed 822 culverts over the past over the six years of the program. Um, 478 of those were identified as barriers, um, which accounts for 58% of the culverts that have been assessed. So again, if you look at this uh, this watershed map um, and the road watercourse crossings that were identified in 2006, and visualize 60% or roughly. 60% of those being barriers to fish passage. You can really see um, to what degree it's an issue in the area and how much of the, of the watershed could potentially be fragmented. I wanted to show this slide. Um, this is an output uh, that we would include in our subwatershed restoration plans or our reports. Um, so this is a subwatershed of the Annapolis River watershed. It's the, uh, the Moose River watershed um, and all the culverts within that that were assessed. And uh, this visually represents uh, the, the barrier status of each of these culverts. So the red dots are full barriers. The yellowy orange squares are, um, are partial barriers and the green ones are passable. So, well, I should also mention that the purple, little purple dots are uh, not fish habitat. You'll see that there are a lot of red dots, um, so a lot of full barriers within the, within the sub-watershed. So again, gives you an idea. Um, to what degree this is an issue. Also, um, I'm going to show you how good of a tool this is to, to identify where we need to go to assess or to, uh, sorry, to remediate the issues that exist. The culvert assessments that we've undertaken um, have allowed us to address some of the issues in the watershed. So over the past, or over the five years where we didn't do any restorations in 2007, uh, we've done 54 fish passage remediations, um, and this has allowed us to improve habitat access to about 110 kilometers um, of fish habitat. And some of that's unaccounted for, so it should actually be a greater area. And we do that, as I mentioned before, uh, for debris removal, such as you can see on the left uh, picture within the slide, um, and also by constructing tailwater control weirs. So here's an example. Um, so this uh, this rock structure downstream installed to elevate the water level and uh, and bring the pool surface uh, closer to what you can barely make out here as a low flow notch within this baffled culvert. So um, it brought, I think, uh, brought the water level up roughly 20 centimeters um, and improved fish passage through this structure. Thank you very much. Um, I I guess we have some time. Hopefully I can take some questions and maybe I can answer them. If not, to defer you to someone who can. Excellent. Thank you, Levi. That was a really good overview of all of the work that CARP has undertaken. Thank you very much.